will also better align disclosure for retail corporate bond issues with equivalent share issues, which already provide a high level of investor protection. So what we're trying to do here is to build up deep and liquid markets for covered bonds and corporate bonds, which will help us channel our national superannuation savings into investment in our economy, not just in someone else's economy. So the three streams that I've outlined today are the next steps we must take in building a competitive and sustainable banking system. We've done the hard work and the hard yards to get this right, to, to ensure that these reforms are effective and enduring and don't risk letting the banks off the hook. We'll now work with our regulators, industry and consumer groups to refine these reforms to implement to implement them as soon as responsibly possible. Now, as I've said all along, there's no silver bullet when it comes to building up competition in the banking sector, but today I'm announcing a raft of changes which will further strengthen competition in this vital sector for the Australian economy. Now, before I take your questions, I might just ask Bill and then David to say a couple of words. Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Treasurer. I'll just say that um, I believe that the banking package outlined by Treasurer Swan passes the test in Main Street in the Australian suburbs and towns. Does this make it easier for consumers and people with mortgages to shift mortgages? And the answer is yes. And does it make it uh, easier for smaller lenders to compete with the large banks? The answer is yes. And in addition, does it strengthen the, uh, uh, the financial sector in Australia? And the answer is yes. I believe today's package hits the sweet spot for competition for consumers in Australia. Thanks very much. It's great to be here with the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer to, uh, for the release of our banking package. Uh, my responsibilities uh, as Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer include areas such as competition policy and consumer affairs and financial literacy. These areas are front and centre of this debate about boosting competition in the banking sector. This package is about many things, but at the heart of the package is an emphasis on consumers, both in the aim of the package and in its method. This is about delivering better services for consumers, for households and businesses, and it's about deploying the most potent weapon that we have in the battle against uh, our banks and to improve banking competition and that is an active and informed consumer. There are a number of ways that we do this through the package, but first and foremost, it's about providing more information to our consumers to ensure that as consumers, we all understand the options that are available to us if we want to seek out the best options for us, our families and our businesses. But secondly, it's about ensuring that we do all that we can to remove those barriers that make it hard for consumers to switch. In the end, the most powerful tool that a consumer has in trying to help get the best deal for themselves is the ability to take their business and walk down the street to a new bank or a new institution. And this package keeps a focus on that aspect. In the end, uh, this package is designed to ensure that as consumers, we all understand that we are not just the victims of a lack of competition when that occurs in the banking sector, but we are very much an important part of trying to drive competition in this sector. And it's through financial literacy, making people available and aware of the choices that exist, that we can ensure that we drive further competition. OK, over to you. And how confident are you that the opposition and independents will let them through? Well, there's, uh, there's several pieces of, of legislation required and there will, some, there will be some that will be uh, presented for consultation uh, forthwith. Uh, for example, the price signalling legislation. Uh, we want to uh, move forward with that relatively quickly. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, draft legislation uh, done. Uh, we will now move into a consultation phase about draft legislation. We will receive industry response to that. We would hope to move that through uh, as quickly as we possibly can. So that's one that stands out immediately. Another one that stands out 
immediately is there'll need to be, I think, a change to the Banking Act for covered bonds. As I've indicated to you, covered bonds are very important to secure uh, further investment uh, within Australia from our superannuation industry. So therefore that will certainly have a priority but I can't give you the full list of uh, legislative uh, priorities for next year, <clears throat> as we'll be working through that in, in terms of uh, the broader agenda that government has. But some of this will have a very high priority for presentation to the parliament early in the new year. Do I expect there to be um, uh, support for this? I certainly hope so. I think this package has uh, a lot of uh, integrity. It's a product of a lot of methodical work, a lot of advice, a lot of consultation, uh, and as you've seen from the behaviour of our uh, larger banks in recent times, is necessary, is absolutely necessary uh, to give consumers the tool, the tools that they required uh, to walk down the road if they're unhappy with their financial institution. So we will be certainly arguing our case strongly, uh, not just uh, with uh, the minor parties in the parliament, more broadly in the community. I've heard Mr Abbott uh, uh, being completely negative again on television last night, so I don't know where the opposition will be, but if they're going to be true to form, they'll just be out there trying to wreck it, as, they've tried, uh, as they are trying to wreck every other sensible initiative that the government puts forward. But we'll certainly be arguing the case for this legislation very strongly. Could I put it in these terms? Because this is not just a technical debate. This really goes to values. If, if you think about our lives, if you think about Australians, uh, the capacity to have a good job with decent pay and conditions and the capacity to have a home and pay off a mortgage are basically the foundation stones of peace of mind. The reason why this is so important is that if you as an Australian who's got a mortgage which you could be locked into for up to 30 years suddenly feel you've been unfairly treated by a large financial institution, at the moment it's really difficult for you to break out of that. And that can have quite significant consequences, not just for your standard of living, but for your peace of mind. So the values on which uh, this uh, package or plan are based are values which go to the very core of what we aspire to be as Australians. Australians dream to own a home. And they know to do that, they've got to have a good job. At the moment, when it comes to employment, Australians are doing really well. The number of jobs created in this country in, in recent times has simply been stunning. But unfortunately, as a consequence of the global financial crisis, the flow of credit is not what Australians require or need. The terms and conditions on which it's coming are not necessarily fair. What we're on about here is giving Australians a fair go, and it's not just Australians who are wanting, wanting to buy a home, it's also anyone who shares the great Australian dream of setting up a small business, the capacity to get access to business finance. This is all linked, and that's why this is such a balanced package. Consumer, me uh, consumer measures, uh, measures to support our smaller lenders, and long-term initiatives to secure the flow of Australian savings back into the development of our economy. And the values on which that is all based are the values of a prosperous economy, good jobs and a decent standard of living with somewhere to live. Non-bank lenders, they charge up to $7,000. Yeah, it's outrageous, isn't it? So non-bank lenders, will they be affected by these changes? And if so, how will that, that, of that course would they hurt will. competition? The, there is no, ab absolutely no justification for anyone to have uh, a, a, an exit fee of $7,000. It is just not justifiable uh, in my view. Now, we have put into this package a range of initiatives to support smaller lenders. I understand smaller lenders have done it tough and there are a, a range of initiatives here which will support the activities of smaller lenders, but if smaller lenders have to depend for their business model on an exit fee as high as $7,000, well, that's just not sustainable. And it's not something that we can tolerate if we want to have a banking system that is competitive and gives people a choice, if they're unhappy with their institution, to walk down the road. Because for $7,000, you'll never shift. You'll never be able to afford to shift. So we can't have fees that high. And of course, it has been fees not that high, but, uh, but fees which are nevertheless high 
and not a true reflection of cost, that has been locking so many Australians into not moving their mortgage. And when they can't move their mortgage, the financial institution, they just clap because they, they, they know that they've got that consumer locked in. What about interest fees? What about interest fees? That's another well, way around it. Well, exactly. Uh, it, it, it could be if you didn't have strong consumer laws like we do, because we've put in place national consumer credit laws, and what we now have for the first time nationally is the power for ASIC to scrutinise all the fees of our banks and declare those that are unconscionable illegal. So if anyone thinks that they're going to come back through the back door and set up Another, another fee, which is simply a substitute for the exit fee, it's not going to be on. Uh, we're awake to them. We're alive to it. And we've got it targeted. But what's what is unconscionable? What is unconscionable? Well, that, that, will be a, that will be a question for ASIC. But, I'll but if, if, if you're familiar with uh, ASIC's discussion paper about unfair mortgage fees, you'll get a sense of how ASIC has been dealing with this, and I won't take, it, yeah. take you through it at great length now. I'll just simply make this point. Any fee that is out of whack with the real cost of doing the business. Any fee that looks excessive and isn't just a fee where you recover your costs. Well, why not abolish them for existing mortgages? This is merely perspective. Someone on $7,000 with a $7,000 exit fee will remain on it after your package. Why have you allowed that to happen? Well, well that would be a reasonable question if it wasn't for what we've already done. And what we've already done is that we have already targeted unfair mortgage exit fees and we have put out the framework and the discussion paper about those in the ASIC paper that I just spoke about before. So we are already dealing... No, 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 no. We are already dealing now... We, no, it, 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 we are already dealing now with unfair mortgage exit fees. What we're saying is, I don't think you can construct laws like this in any other way, because you need certainty in the system, is that we're banning them altogether. But we've taken a step on the way to that by what we're doing right now, right now, by targeting unfair fees. We haven't banned them, next step is banning them. So I think we've been moving through that process and we're getting to the end of that process. And that is, that, and that, and that is, that is the only responsible way to do that. But I might just ask my colleagues if they want to add to that. No, you're right. No. Okay. The, point. the reality is the millions of Australians who already have mortgages will not be able to get out of those exit fees. It, it, millions, millions of Australians who have mortgages now uh, now have access to the new laws that we have put in place. And unconscionable conduct is exercisable right now. Right? So, and, so, part and, so part and parcel. So part and parcel of what we will be doing informing Australians about this package is telling them that. As part of it, because I don't believe they know. Those fees will remain the same, won't they? Be part. Those well, depends if it depends if they're unconscionable or not. They may not. They, they, they may not remain the same. But that's the whole point. I don't think you're quite getting what we've already done. What we're announcing today is their abolition altogether. But the fact is that we have put in place the framework to deal with them right now. That's why the ASIC paper was published a month or so ago. Uh, and that there is the framework for dealing with those. And I don't think. I'd have to, I stand to be corrected here, there'd be any other way you could responsibly deal with it other than the way that we are doing that right now. So because, we because we've been active in this space for a long time. So when you've got um, Bernie Fraser looking at a couple of things, including a central repository of all mortgages, <coughs> wouldn't Ben Chifley be really happy that the Labor Party is effectively going in to nationalise the mortgage system? No, no, we're not going to nationalise the mortgage system at all. Uh, there's a couple of issues here, and they go to, go, go to the capacity of people to move. Let's take uh, mortgage lenders' insurance, right? Now, now at, at the moment, you go along to a bank, uh, your deposit is relatively small, you get charged mortgage lenders' insurance. It can be something like $7,000. So if you've invested $7,000 in mortgage lenders' insurance and you've and, and you're bought into your, into your loan, you, you, it's like an exit fee. You're locked, locked there forever. If you go through the package, we're trying to find a way where we can get a, a central repository, if you like, of, of, of uh, people who've paid their insurance and trying to make that transferable. What happens to those people now is they lose it if, if, if they terminate their loan. So you'll see through this package 
uh, a number of areas where we're talking about what we can do to make people, uh, to give people the ability to move without suffering <coughs> some of these other consequences that can occur as is the case with mortgage lenders insurance. Now, you'd also also be aware that there are various ways in which if people get a mortgage, they go along to some state department and pay their stamp duty. If they want to get out of it, effectively they get charged twice or three times. What we're talking about for a central repository is you only ever pay that fee once. So this is not nationalisation. It's actually trying to make sure that people don't get caught up in paying a multiple of taxes, which becomes the disincentive for them to ever to ever move, that's that, that, that's what it's aimed at. It's nothing, nothing like that. But you know, if people want to call me all sorts of names for backing the mutuals, fair enough. I don't apologise for it. Uh, the mutuals are going to be a very important part of this framework for all of the reasons that I, outli I outlined before. Uh, they're a safe alternative. What I want to see is more competition, and to have the competition, you've got to remove some of these roadblocks, which lock people in to terms and conditions and they can't get out. The government guarantee over funding to be extended, for instance, extended to RMBS. Can you talk about why that wasn't chosen yeah, as an option in the end? Can, I, can sure. I also ask a related question, which is about the bullet bonds in RMBS? You mentioned that there are some bullet bonds being issued now. In that case, what actually is there that the government needs to do to change the system if they're already being issued? Well, well uh, in terms of bullet bonds, to get it going, the first issuance was with our AOFM. That, that's the whole point. This is the sort of work we've already been doing and the bullet bond uh, is now a logical consequence. Now, the bullet bond is entirely different from normal RMBS. And the difference with the bullet bond, this is quite important, is that it is more like an ordinary bond because the, um, uh, the, the, the principal is repaid at the end. In, norm, in normal RMBS, you repay both interest and principal regularly. What investors want what superannuation fund funds want uh, is, is a financial instrument, more like a bond. So the bullet bond is, a, is RMBS that is more like, more like in profile and in terms of income, a normal bond. So a superannuation fund wanders along and says, oh, look, I, I might take that bullet bond over there because it's going to mature in such and such a time uh, and I, I've got the income profile, all of that. We've been doing this work. This is the evolution of our investment of uh, our investment in RMBS up until now. If you have a look, for example, at RMBS issuance, when we first started with the first tranche uh, back at the end of 2008 through early 2009, we were, we, we were the investor in most of the issuance, 80 per cent, and the private sector was 20 per cent. What's actually happening now, as the market is coming back, is that we're, we're, we're the investor for 20 per cent and, and, and the, uh, the market is 80 per cent. And as we've been through this process, and as we've worked with the industry about what we can do about their funding needs, they've said to us, well, if we could get a bullet bond going, this, this would further uh, encourage other investors, such as the superannuation funds, but not them exclusively, to become more interested in RMBS, like they used to be before the global financial crisis. So the first bullet bond uh, has now been issued. Now it's been done once. Uh, there will be a discussion about that and, and hopefully we'll see more of that happen. That is, what is, that is why what we've done up until now, in the three years to now, is so important to what we're doing for the next three years. They are all linked. We have been really active in this area ever since uh, this crisis hit and particularly uh, when we had to live with the consequences of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which stopped the flow of credit to the Australian economy and when, if we hadn't acted, this economy would have been in deep trouble. The guarantee made sure that people knew their deposits were safe wherever they left them, whether it was in a big bank, whether it was in a credit union, whether it was in a building society. And the wholesale funding guarantee got that funding back. The problem is we are too reliant structurally on overseas funding. Bullet bonds, a corporate bond market, covered bonds, are ways of lessening our reliance upon overseas investors and marshalling the savings of Australians and getting it reinvested in our system. And by the way, and in doing that, 
providing some competition for the big banks. What is your benchmark for success here? Is it for the mutuals to move from the 10% market share that they more or less had, had forever to towards 20% within the my, my benchmark for success is that Australians have the peace of mind and been able to change relatively easily over time through these changes. I am not here today endorsing one financial institution over another. I don't mind if people want to stay with the big banks, providing it's an act of choice not an act of coercion. Uh, if people want to go to a mutual, great for them. If they believe in mutuals, they need to have the information that their mutual is safe, that their deposits are protected. So we're not here with a package that does anything other than attend to what are competitive roadblocks in the flow of finance in our financial system, taking or trying to eliminate them or remove them or take the edge off them so the consumer can take those decisions on their terms, not on the terms of some chief executive of one of the major banks. Treasurer, on the portability of both bank accounts, yeah. is it your intention that that would act like uh, mobile phone numbers? You keep your number and you go Look, to it's another... It's a really good question. Is, is that your intention? Do you think it is realistic prospect that this could ever happen? Uh, or is this just... No, I think it's really difficult. I think it's really difficult, which is why we've gone down the Bernie Fraser road. Let me, let's use the example of mobile phones. This is a very good example. It took 15 years to get mobile phone number portability in Australia in what was a new and young and dynamic market. Trying to get deposit account portability in an older, established, much more complex market where each of the, the, the major institutions has different technology and so on is really hard. But we think it's worth a go. But I, you know, I'm not raising expectations about it, but we think it is certainly worth a go. There's no country that's successfully done it. Uh, and our regulators have to be happy with how we approach it. So doing it in this way is the only responsible way of going about it. Thanks very much. Sorry, well, I'm sorry. There is there is uh, there is uh, uh, stuff in here for small business. Uh, all of what we're doing, in, particularly in terms of the smaller lenders, is for, for small business as well as mortgage holders. But in terms specifically of small business, our last tranche of RMBS uh, investment and the one that is coming also has a small business focus and I'm more than happy uh, to supply you with the evidence of how some of that money is now flowing to small business. But generally, making the market more competitive is just as important to someone who's got that dream in Australia of establishing a small business as it is to someone who's got the dream of owning a home. Treasurer, one, just one last one. So that's uh, the Treasurer uh, exiting.